Hey everybody, and welcome to week two of our Advent series. Today we're talking about the actual event, what actually happened the night that Jesus was born. Now we've all seen nativity scenes and they have a typical setup. Of course you have Mary and Joseph and they're surrounding Jesus who is actually lying in a manger. It's usually filled with hay. They're surrounded by a couple of shepherds, uh, maybe some sheep. There might be a donkey there, three wise men and a camel. And all this takes place in a, kind of like a barn like this one with a, a roof kind of overhanging the scene and it has an open front. And in pictures of the nativity, there's usually like this real prominent star way up overhead, right? So these pieces look something like this. So classic art actually provides some inspiration for these nativity scenes. I'm going to show you some pictures here. The first one is called The Nativity. It was painted in 1475. These are all Renaissance era paintings. This one's by a guy named Francesca. Nativity at Night, that's another one, painted by a guy named St. Jean's or something like that in 1480s. Mystic Nativity is the next one, and that one's by Botticelli, and that was in 1498. And then this final one is Adoration of the Shepherds, and that was painted by a guy named Correggio about 32 years later in 1530. Now, all of these paintings kind of serve to remind us or reinforce in us this story that we've all heard about the nativity, that Mary and Joseph journeyed to Bethlehem to take part in this worldwide census that was happening. And arriving late one night, they were told by this innkeeper that, hey, there's no more space left. There's no more room left in the inn. And so you're going to have to sleep somewhere else. So real desperate, they have to find a place that ends up being kind of like a barn, a, a stable. And Jesus is born that night and uh, they're surrounded by animals. Shepherds come and worship him and some wise men come and worship him as well. But how much of that story is actually uh, founded in what Luke and Matthew, who are the only two that tell us any details about the story, say? And how much of it is stuff that we just kind of added in? So last week, we kicked off the series by spending some time looking at our traditions, and today we're going to talk about the event. And I really invite you to kind of lean into this Get focused because we're going to get into some details of the story that uh, might uh, be a little extreme, right? They might be further into the story than you've ever gone before. And the reason why is that I believe that many people interact with the nativity, interact with the birth of Jesus like it's a fairy tale. And I think part of the reason is because whenever we talk about it, we kind of remove it from real world history. We remove it from the real culture in which it took place. And in the process, we kind of fail to grasp it for all that it is. Jesus's birth is not a fairy tale. It's a real event involving real people who have real life circumstances. And it's set in a real city that still exists on this earth today. So we're going to focus on two accounts that we have of the event, one from Matthew and one from Luke. I'm going to read them both together. Now, the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Hey, don't be afraid to take her as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She'll bear a son. You're to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, which was, Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. And when Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded, and took her as his wife and had no marital relations with her until she had born a son, and he named him Jesus. That was Matthew's account, Luke's. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. 
This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. So all went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was descended from the house and family of David. So he went to be registered with Mary to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. Now, like I said, we're going to dive into some of the nitty gritty details of the story, but we're not going to dive all the way in because uh, there's just a level of intensity that you might not be ready for. So what we're going to do is uh, we have a podcast that's available on our app and you can download that and it's going to go really deep into some of these things like uh, the census, like the location that Jesus was born, like the wise men and who are they and why are they there? And then also angels, because that's kind of weird, right? First, though, there is uh, some controversy surrounding Luke's claim here about the census. We have no record of any census at this time, and we don't have any record of Rome ever doing any census in a client kingdom like Herod's was, okay? The more complicated problem with Luke's statement here is that the guy that he says was governor at the time, Quirinius, well, he didn't become governor until like 10 years later. So what's the deal? Well, as I said, you can get a real detailed explanation and deep dive into this on the podcast under the teaching and audio section. But I'm just going to give you kind of where I land on it after studying this. Luke has demonstrated remarkable historical accuracy overall. So let's give him the benefit of the doubt. You might be skeptical about that. Well, how about this? We know that Luke knew about the census that we're historically aware of that happened in 6 or 7 AD because he actually references it in Acts chapter 5. So Luke and Acts, written by the same guy, the same hand, to the same addressee at the same time with the same purpose. Why would a meticulous guy like Luke, who deeply believes that Jesus is the king, who's seeking to communicate that truth with others, undermine his own story by including two competing facts that obviously don't make sense together. I think there's historical evidence that we've not discovered yet, and there's plenty of, uh, plenty of reasons for us to just kind of wait and see and give Luke the benefit of the doubt in the meantime. If you want to know why I landed there, check out the podcast. Second question, the barn. Was Jesus actually born in a barn? Well, there's a long way to answer that question on the podcast, but you'd probably prefer the short way. Traditionally, English translators choose in for this Greek word, but the more appropriate translation is guest room. How do we know that? Well, Luke uses that same word that's here one more time. It's in chapter 22, and there it clearly means guest room. It's actually where Jesus and his disciples eat their last supper together. He does use a word for a public house for the reception of strangers, which we would call an inn, in the Good Samaritan parable, where the guy fixes him up and pays for him to stay in an inn while he recovers. So Luke actually uses two distinct Greek words here to describe uh, whatever this guest room is and an inn. When we consider that factor, which is a really important one, along with the classical family model, the devotion to hospitality in the ancient world, the structure of first century homes, and the archaeological evidence that we've already found around Bethlehem, along with the length of their stay, because Luke indicates that they actually were there for a period of time before this happened. We come to uh, a place where it's difficult to accept the version of the nativity that we see in some of those paintings that were painted in the Renaissance. And we've showed the layout of houses in the first century Judea before. I'm going to do that again. They look something like this, a typical two-room peasant cottage in Bethlehem. It had a upper room, a, a low room. This low room was a place where they would bring animals in for the night. And there were mangers that were actually built in to these. They weren't typically made of wood. They were made of rock. And they looked something like this one that was found very close to Bethlehem 
in Judea. Uh, that's in an archaeological dig. So the overwhelming consensus among Bible scholars is that Jesus wasn't born in a barn, but he was actually born in the home of one of Joseph's family members because there were too many people staying there and not everyone could stay in the upper room. Now, the Catholic Church has claimed for a long time, for well over a thousand years, that Jesus was born in a cave, and that belief originates from a couple of first uh, church fathers, Justin Martyr and Origen of Alexandria, and they claim that Jesus was born in a cave. Origen even says, hey, the locals can actually show you the place where Jesus was born. There's actually a church right there today in that same spot. It's called the Church of the Nativity. And so how do you reconcile those things, early church fathers and what they said? Well, it's actually kind of simple because there's plenty of proof that in the hill country of Bethlehem, many of the homes would have actually used caves for their lower rooms. So why is that important? Well, because if it's true, it's important. And I think that it helps ground the story a little bit more in history. Okay, but the point of this is the same, that there is no glamour in this because no matter how you slice it, no matter where specifically Jesus was born, we know it wasn't in a palace. We know that it wasn't surrounded by a paparazzi and press. Okay, there's a teenage girl giving birth without any doctor present, no medicine, on a rocky floor holding the hand of her fiance who everybody else believes has gotten her pregnant before they said their marriage vows in the middle of nowhere. This is a poor couple from a poor family. As I said, this, this birth gets no press at all. There are no Instagram filters to make this look a little better than it is. The truth is that this creator king comes silently in. As silent as snow falling, he came in. And when no one was looking in the darkness, he came. That's from Sally Lloyd-Jones in the Jesus Storybook Bible. However, there were some people who got to share in the excitement. This is a continuation of Luke's narrative. He says, in that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then the angel of the Lord stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, don't be afraid for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people to you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel of a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace among those whom he favors. And when the angels had left them they, and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Hey, let's go and see this thing. So they went with Hayes and they found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child, which is that he was the Messiah and Lord. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. Okay, let's talk about angels. Those are everyone's favorite words, right? Angels are one of those things that are difficult for us to understand for a few reasons. Most of us have never actually seen one that we know of, and yet the word brings some real specific images into our mind, doesn't it? And that's because we've seen many cultural depictions of angels over the years, like these. Check these out. These are, these are cultural depictions of what angels look like, and that one's pretty weird. Truthfully, these images probably do more to reinforce the fairy tale image than anything else in the story. They don't do angels justice. Okay, the Hebrew word and concept of angels, we translate into the English language as angel. It simply means messenger. And we have some specific types of these messengers talked about in the Old Testament, cherubim and seraphim. These are messengers mentioned here in Luke and in, in Matthew that are a part of God's creation. Like that's what they were designed to do. These are messenger beings and they exist in this different dimension, we'll call it, called heaven. And sometimes when heaven breaks through, humans can see that dimension. And I believe that's what happens right here. Again, uh, we'll explore this more in depth about angels in the audio on the app. 
But when this dimension becomes visible, it's majestic and terrifying. So the night that Jesus was born, angels appeared to shepherds singing and telling them that in Bethlehem, a savior king had been born. Now this was in the hill country. This is before electricity. There is zero light pollution happening. So imagine their surprise. Imagine their terror when suddenly the dark sky is completely illuminated, when all is bright and the sound waves that are resonating around them are ones they've never heard before. A glorious sound proclaiming glory to God in the highest and shalom on the earth. So this is heaven opened up, intersecting with earth in a pure, unfiltered sense. But the shepherds were the only ones who got to see this beautiful array of light. They're the only ones who get to hear this breathtaking song. Shepherds, profession, very close to God's heart. Now this is a really cool demonstration of the paradox that's happening through this event. Luke is communi communicating to us the essence of this event, that it is simple, and yet it's more profound than we could ever understand. It is more common than it ever should have been, and yet there's a level of mystery to it that we cannot fathom. It's very earthy, it's raw, it's real, but at the same time, it's heavenly and majestic. It's calm but it's turbulent, it's subtle, but it's bold. So the event of God's arrival actually tells us something about God himself. The method of his entry underscores his nature and the nature of the kingdom that he will bring. A kingdom of peace, sleeping through the silent night kingdom of joy beheld in the eyes of a first-time father, a kingdom of love wrapped in the arms of his mother. So who cares if the Renaissance nativity scene paintings got some of the details wrong? Because they all captured this one detail perfectly well, which is this. The artisan is now inside the paint. <laughs> 